One of them, I, I want to say before I even get started, I have talked with so many wonderful people here, and the kind comments that I've gotten about the, my book and people that have listened to our podcast and everything probably has been one of the most humbling things I've ever went through. And uh, you guys are just precious, and so thank you guys. My passion is not just studying UFOs, it's not just studying the Nephilim. My passion is preparing the remnant for the last days. I want to shake them, I want to wake them, I want to train them. Uh, if you're looking for someone who is going to pat you on the head, you've, walked, you've come to the wrong place. My job is to teach you how to put on your combat boots and how to get suited up in your armor for what's coming. And one of the things that, uh, that we have in the Old Testament, the Bible says the Old Testament was given for our example. Yes. And there's such a wealth of information there. One, I think one of the problems that we have in the modern church today is we have disenfranchised the New Testament from the Old Testament. And when you do that, you take the entire New Testament out of context. And so I want to deal today with Jericho. And as I was studying on Jericho, and I've dealt a lot with spiritual warfare, I ran across this quote from the Lexham Bible Dictionary that literally set up a red flag for me. I'm sitting there reading and, and thinking, okay, you know, uh, when they went around Jericho, it was during Passover or, or during the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and I want to bring that in. And I read this, and I said, wait a minute, stop the press. Listen to this. The manner of Jericho's destruction, the wall of this final bronze age city of Jericho is referred to as a Cyclopean wall. And I said, What? Cyclopean. Anybody ever read David Flynn, Mark Flynn, uh, L.A. Marzulli, any of those? Cyclopean is Nephilim architecture. And so I'm saying, wait a minute. <laughs> and then they said, well, you know, it was constructed around 1600 B.C. It can't have been, or at least a part of it could not have been, because that would have been after the flood, and all of the Cyclopean, true Cyclopean architecture was pre-flood. And so I wanted to do a little bit of digging, and I found this quote out of Wikipedia. Perhaps one of the most important discoveries uh, was evidence that the earliest wall suggested by Kenyon, which was an archaeologist, to the date of around 8,000 B.C., based upon radiocarbon dating. Now, that radiocarbon dating can be wrong, and Chuck Messler has gotten into that. Uh, one of the things that, it, with what, what I have seen and taught, anybody ever wonder why God said, let there be light, but then it was not until the fourth day that you had stars and the moon and all that? It wasn't that the lights necessarily came on in the first day. Two things. Number one, it shows the character of God. He didn't create darkness. Dark was already there. When God comes, he brings his kingdom, and he begins to separate his kingdom from the darkness that was there. But he's, when, he, when God said, let there be light, the speed of light is connected with, temp, with the temporal dimension. He created time. It was at that moment. And so when you carbon date, one of the problems that you have Biblically, is this planet resided outside of time before it was moved into time. So how can you carbon date that which resided out of time? It's all going to be messed up, isn't it? But it does predate the foundation of Jericho to pre-flood. Now, with Cyclopean architecture, and I want to go back to the, this first one. Where we, we, we see those. There are two types of Cyclopean architecture. One is the big monoliths that we've seen. And what we've discovered is many of those are the foundational stones. In fact, with what uh, Steve Quayle is beginning to discover in Peru and stuff, the deeper you go, even the bigger they get. But then you have the second level, you have these, but the same type of technology is there, that they're seamless it, it, the, at all these weird angles, and it, it's, we, we can't even uh, replicate it today. The only other uh, type of architecture that comes close to this is the Great Pyramid of Giza which I believe is also antediluvian. It survived the flood. And I believe it was built by the watchers, so it's, it's watcher technology. They were more precise. They didn't have to get on these weird shapes and everything, and so their children had to have their own signature with what they built. But this led me to, to consider several things that we need to look at here. 
Why was Jericho strategic? Why, why did the Almighty, he brought them to the area that when they crossed over the Jordan, they were facing Jericho. There, there's something that we have missed behind this. And I'm going to have to do it this way because <laughs> I cannot see my notes. But I, I wanted to understand what was going on here. Now, Joshua, when he, he dealt with Jericho, he said, and Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that raises up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set the gate thereof. In other words, Joshua said, if anyone ever tries to rebuild Jericho, when he tries to reset the foundation, his oldest son shall die, and when he finishes the work, it will cost him his firstborn son, or his, his youngest son. That's kind of rough, isn't it? Because there was something strategic about Jericho. In fact, we find when we get into 1 Kings that a man did, in fact, rebuild Jericho. When he set the foundational stone, his oldest child died. When he finished the work, his youngest child died. And what's it, what is really interesting is, is there, there is a connection between sin, iniquity, and the occult, and Jericho, that brings it all together. And the only time in, in, in ancient history that they could have ever attempted to rebuild Jericho was under the reign of Ahab and Jezebel. And so there's a lot more there than we realize. If the very foundation of Jericho was Nephilim, the very foundation, they basically built upon the ruins of an ancient Nephilim citadel. It was demonically charged. One of the things when you, and, and don't study the occult, let people like me that, that can do it without getting all screwed up in the head do it. Because um, it, it will, it will if, if you're not balanced in the word of God, it'll suck you right in. And there's a lot of stuff over the years that I've read that I've had to burn after I've read it. But physical objects can hold demonic power. It can hold satanic power. And when you really understand what was going on, guys, Jericho was an energy generator of occult power that drew the giants into the promised land. That they felt more comfortable there. It gave them a place, a base of operations, a base of occult power in which the Anakim and all the rest of them were doing their things. And when God said, I've got to bring you over and to take back the promised land, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to tear down their power source. Now, and I, I want to show you the, how poetic God is with all this. Steve Quayle, in, in his research with Nephilim, he said that, you know, how, you know, how did they get those monolithic stones? Because even though, you know, these guys could be, you know, 20, 30 feet tall or whatever, how in the world can you pick up some of the size stones that they had and put them into place with the precision that they had? And he said that they had these nasal cavities in which they could create a resonance that would create a levitational field that they could set these things into place. And uh, you say, Mike, that's the craziest thing that I've ever heard of. Well, there's actually a science behind it called cymatics. Sound, harmonic sound waves. In fact, one of the things that caught my attention about cymatics, if I had a, um, a soundproof booth setting up here that I could resonate into, and I would have a Petri dish full of sand. Now, this only works with two languages, Hebrew and Sanskrit, which is very close to Hebrew that if I would go on the microphone and say Aleph, it would resonate through that sand and it would write an Aleph in the sand. Or bet, it would, it would form a bet. Because sound affects matter. We know that because the Almighty spoke and the entire universe came into existence. In fact, when you understand one of the, one of the basic things about string theory that got my attention was that at the, the quark, the smallest element in the universe, has a little string that is resonating. In other words, all creation is still resonating at the sound of God's voice. 
Now, this isn't in my notes. I'm going to throw this out as extra. That I wanted to prove this theory if God was showing me something that, that was really significant. So I wanted to know what the harmonic resonance of planet Earth is. It's 7.83. And if anybody ever uh, studies biblical numbers, 7 is God's plan of salvation. 8 is the new birth, the new beginning. 3 is God's perfect witness. That God literally, his signature is on this planet. And this planet is resonating still with the power of God's voice. And to show you how crucial that is, that when we have our astronauts that go outside of our atmosphere, they have to have something installed in, in both their capsules, their, their um, space suits. It's called a Schumann resonator because you will absolutely lose. It'll, it'll, it'll transform the way that you think. If you step away from that, you'll eventually lose your mind. You cannot live outside that resonance. What's it called again? The Schumann resonator. In fact, one of the things I have in my office, because they decided to create a, a, build a cell phone tower literally 40 feet behind my office. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. I've been rebuking it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but I, I got a Schumann resonator to override the, the magnetic harmonics of what they're doing with setting up the cell phone tower. Because I, I prefer, I like my consciousness the way it is working right now. Um, but to show you what God did and, and how that uh, God has, has both a sense of humor, and, and he, he created servants like me because he really has a sense of humor, <laughs> and, and that he, there's, there's always a balance with justice with God. If they used harmonics in building the foundation of the walls, Almighty God took his own people, surrounded this citadel, and they begin to show their, sound their shofars. They begin to shout praises to God. And God turned his people into a harmonic weapon to dismantle what the Nephilim had built. And see, I think the collapsing, the collapsing of what was in that wall, because they, they built upon it. And when you begin to find out the way that those that lived in Jericho were, they would take aborted babies or babies that they had murdered and sacrifice, and they would implant them into the wall so that it would give strength to their gods to protect the city. So you had all that filth, all that garbage, all that occultism embedded into those walls, and God says, I'm going to take it down. Wow. I, I don't know about you, but that just makes me happy. You see, there's, there's nothing that the devil can do that God can't outdo or undo. There's nothing in your life that the enemy meant for bad when you give yourself to Jesus, God can turn it around. He may have to tear it down. He may have to replace it with something else. But there's nothing that the devil can do that Almighty God cannot take down and move out of the way. Amen. Now, you know, everybody, everything in that city was accursed. You know, God says you can't take, you can't take any of it. You can't, in fact, Rahab was the only exception. You know why? Uh, and in fact, when the, when the walls fell, there was only one small section that remained. Because there was a scarlet thread hanging out the wall. Oh. But why was it, you see, accursed mean, means devoted. No one else can have it. God says, don't touch it. Don't mess with it. Well, when you realize, and all the other places, they were able, to, when you understand the Torah, every place else they went, they were able to take the spoils. Now, they, there was a purifying ritual they had to do, some by water, some by, by fire, to purify it. But even the gold and everything that was there, no matter what it was, God says, don't touch it, kill every living thing. <laughs> well, when you understand the Anakim and, and all the different things that they were doing and that there was bestiality and everything else going on there. God says don't let anything because of what they've done in that place and that the people that live there, the animals that live there, everything had been tainted. You don't want to release that and, to, and have to mess with that later on. It has to be tore down because all of it can hold demonic power. One of the things that I've had to deal with the missionaries sometimes coming from the mission field, and they send them out and don't teach them spiritual warfare, which is like sending a, a soldier into war and never putting him through basic training as far as I'm concerned. Because when you're in the heat of the battle, exegeting really doesn't work a lot unless you know how to bind up the enemy in Jesus' name and to, and to do these things. Then the exegesis comes in great when you're teaching people the Word of God. God knew 
that if his people would take any of it, that demonically charged power would begin to affect their lives. Okay? Now, accursed means a thing devoted, a thing dedicated uh, to have utterly destroyed or utter destruction. So God said, listen, don't touch this, don't take this, don't, don't mess with it. And how many know there's a lot of things in our lives that uh, God tells us not to mess with? We ought to heed what God says. One of, the, one of the, the things that I have found in my Torah study, and you don't necessarily get it in the English language when you're reading it, but the people of God would always say, we will hear and we will do. We will hear and we will do. Moses, you speak to us, we will hear and we will do it. But there's a couple of places in the Hebrew that it's reversed. And the rabbis have always pondered why they said, we will do and we will hear. And here's the biblical secret of the kingdom. Sometimes... You do it without understanding because you can only receive the understanding after you have done it and you saw how God's kingdom begins to move in operation. So many times things have to move from theory to proven application through you simply being obedient. And you're, you'll, I mean, God loves our honesty. I don't understand why you want me to do this. I can't see the logic in it. But, Daddy, I trust you. I'm just going to do it because you told me to do it. And I, I have found with the word of God that I've gotten to a place where dad says not do it. I don't, I don't care if I used to like to do it. I don't do it no more. He says, don't do it. I don't do it. He says, do it. I do it. And I find out just how much more wonderful life can become when I get my do's lined up with my don'ts and I don't do the don'ts and I start doing the do's. And if you get so busy doing the do's, you don't have time to worry about the don'ts. Because you start having a blast. Now, what we learned about Achan, he found a Babylonian garment. It wasn't, maybe it wasn't even a true Babylonian. It was a knockoff. <laughs> it was Babylonian-ish. And gold and silver that he hid. Now, this, this is one of the things when we begin understanding Christian community and the dynamic. You are not an island. Parents, what you bring into your home can affect your children. That which you think is secret may be secret to your family, but it's not secret to hell. You think it was by chance that these, these things caught the attention of Achan? I always remember his name because after they got through with him, he was Achan, okay? Um, real easy. It's like, you know, which was, one of, which was the, the bad son of Noah? It was the one that wasn't kosher. He was Ham, you know? It, sometimes these things help. But the kingdom of darkness put in his heart to bring these things because it contaminated the camp. Amen. New Testament, 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul said, if you want God to walk among you, you must put away the unclean. And then in italics in the King James, it's thing. And I love the honesty of the King James Bible because if it's in italics, that means it's not there. And so when the Apostle Paul said unclean, everything the Torah says is unclean, the Apostle Paul just told the Gentiles they needed to get rid of. Amen. Because if it's unclean, it's connected to the kingdom of darkness, and it becomes a conduit for the kingdom of darkness to come in. And he said, listen, God wants to walk with you. You know, can we imagine where the children of Israel were, were, were living out, were wandering in the wilderness? How can you ensure that Almighty God would be in the camp to protect you. Keep it clean. But what was one of the chief things to keep it clean? It was a shovel. Because you go do your business outside the camp. Because God would not walk among that. Listen to me, church. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be kept outside the camp. Amen. That we don't need to be bringing in our homes. That we don't need to be bringing in our churches. Because we're... we're this is probably helping me because I'm so far away from my notes because I can't see them. Um, <laughs> we are walking in about this much of the kingdom right now. I, I was on a, a radio show and we brought up the movie Carrie, you know the, and all. And I said, I said, you know, I said that would have been a real short movie if you had a believer walking with God. She'd have went, Whoop, I bind you in the name of Jesus, and you just simply roll the credits at the end because the movie's over. <laughs> 
There are levels of the power of God that only a people that have consecrated themselves and remove the unclean and make sure that everything is under the blood of Jesus. And, you know, you, you, in a sense, there's this canopy when you first get saved. But the sanctification process nobody wants to preach about anymore <laughs> is then the Holy Spirit really gets on your case because now he's moved in. And he says, you know what? I've got to rearrange the place. There's some things you got to get rid of because I and it can't be in the same room. And if I come in that room, I'm going to start sending stuff to the garbage to get rid of it. It's called sanctification. And that sanctification process is the more room I have for him and the more room that has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, the more of the kingdom I can flow in. And Israel needed to flow in the kingdom of God even when they went over to Ai, which was this little insignificant thing. But without God, they were not able to do it. And because of what Achan did, men died. That means kids didn't have a daddy. There is a consequence to sin that goes beyond you. That's why we have to avoid it. Yeah, but God's grace. Yeah, but God's grace. God's grace is here to give you the power to look the devil in the eye and say no. Okay, we have went so far from my notes. That's a, this is okay. Listen, guys. There are five aspects of grace. And the first one is God's unmerited favor. And nobody wants to go past that because that is the warm fuzzy. Unmerited favor. I didn't deserve it. Jesus died for me while I was yet a sinner. Good. Now enter into saving grace. Let him save you. Let him put you in the kingdom. Go ahead and yield to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit until you see the ugliness of sin. You're never going to see the beauty of the cross. And why we have so many church members that are offended at the cross is they're still in love with their sin and it looks wonderful to them. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Okay, let go. Um, once you get saved, you got to go into transforming grace. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And that is Ozarkian for the least little bit you could do because you've been saved. And be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There is a grace to transform us from what we were to what we should be now in Christ. And all of us, no matter how far along we get in the kingdom, we're just a pale version of what could have been. Oh, come on. But there's something on the other side of transforming grace, empowering grace. You see, that's where I'm wanting to get the body right now. Because if we take down the Jerichos in our life, every one of us have the sin that so easily besets us. Every one of us have a spiritual stronghold that gives the enemy a right to mess with us as much as he has messed with us. And deliverance never gets a hold of the stronghold. It's only the stragglers outside the fort. But when God begins to transform us, what he begins to do is simply go through everything that we have received as reality. How many of us have been convinced something was right only to find out later on it was wrong? You see, sometimes strongholds are simply a lie somebody told you when you were little. Or it was somebody that violated trust. And the enemy said, you're worthless. It's not your, you know, it's all your fault. No, it wasn't. It was a demon that did it because he was trying to find a place to build a stronghold in your life that was going to hold you back the rest of your life. And when you yield to unmerited favor, to saving grace, to transforming grace, the Holy Spirit says, let's look at this stronghold back here. Oh, no, I don't want to mess with that because then you're going to change my paradigm. You're going to. Lord, now, you know, I can tell everybody, you just have to set me the way that I am because if you only knew what I went through. 
Come on. If you, if you only knew the lies that Grandma taught me, then you would know that you need to tolerate me. And I can be the little poop in the kingdom of God and not get away with it because I've got a past. Well, welcome to the club. All of us have got a past. And the Holy Spirit brings us up and says, I want to empower you. Part of the transformation is you are given authority in Christ to stare that lie down and say, you are a lie. You see, the resonance of God speaking through you to create within you a harmonic weapon to pull down the lies. I need a hanky. <laughs> the greatest things that God has ever done in my life is when he brought me face to face with something that I was sure was true. And God said, that was a lie. And he said, you start speaking truth to that lie. You lose my resonance over what the enemy spoke in your life. Start speaking what I said was supposed to be in your life. And as I do, the walls are going to start coming down. And see, that is when we get to the place where we can begin bringing down because all of us simply have one stronghold. Nobody has multiple strongholds. You can have a whole bunch of crazy cowboys living in that one fort. Okay? <laughs> But when you pull the walls down, they have no place to go but out. And how do you know they're there? Anybody have a preacher start stepping on your toes and something raises up on the inside of you? I don't like that. That's the stronghold talking. You're getting too close to truth. You get mad at the preacher. You change the channel. You go ahead and throw that CD away. I've had guys throw CDs of mine away, and the next morning they were sitting back on top of their desk, and they didn't, and nobody was got in the room. You know, I had one guy write me and says, "You know what, Mike Lake, you're like a bad penny." Because <laughs> the Holy Spirit said, "You know what, I got your number, Jack." And I'm going to keep putting it there. And I'm going to keep putting it there. I'm going to keep putting it there because God was wanting that. See, that's that transforming grace. You, you get transformed, you get that thing down. You can begin establishing the kingdom of God. You, you can turn that into a field to be planted with the word of God, to raise up a harvest, to move in the empowering grace of God. You see, the empowering grace of God, you, instead of you having a prison in you, you can be in the prison and you start saying to God and all God has to do is start tapping his toe and the, and the jail comes open. Guys, some of the things we went through about a 10-year period where we had the occult trying to kill our family because of what we were doing. They tried to crash a jet into our home. We've been poisoned. I think one of the, the, the most remarkable things that I saw, you know, anybody ever drive, you know, like, like in, in, in the country where it's just a two-lane road and there's pasture on both sides with big, huge ditches? Yes. Going down one of those, you know, and in Missouri, all of our roads were, were made over the top of ruts that drunk cowboys made when they were, you know. Listen. Now, if you walk across the field, it's a quarter mile, but it's 15 miles if you take the road, you know. They call those roads in Missouri. We're going down one of those, and a semi loses control and starts doing this on the highway, 100 foot away from us. I have no place to go because if I go off in the ditch, you kind of go, oh in the ditch and uh, I'm trying to strategically find that my wife said Jesus I saw an 18 wheeler and it was like God reached down and grabbed it and all 18 wheels came off the ground and it was set on the right side of the road where it belonged and the only one more astonished than we were was the truck driver driving the truck <laughs> he may have been a case for the need for depends I don't know um <laughs> But guys, we need to walk in that power. But as we approach the end of days, Lucifer's bringing his A game. He's bringing his A team. 
Our challenge is to be transformed to the place to become God's A team in the last days. So that means we've got to allow God's transformational grace to take a hold of our lives so that we can get into his empowering grace. You see, there's a level of walking with God we saw with the Apostle Peter that it created a field of the kingdom around him that if you got close enough that you were within shadow distance, sickness left your body. You guys, there, we, we are so far away. You see, that's part of the problem with the Laodicean church because we have wealth, physical wealth. It's deceptive because it can mimic spirituality. But I want to be, you know... You know, well, the, you know, having money is not a sin, but it kind of is unhandy. But you don't trust in it, you know. Peter and Paul said, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And Solomon was wrong. Money doesn't answer with all things. But then when he actually said that, he was talking out of things that were vain, vanity. If you set it back in context. For every one of us, I don't care how young we are or how old we are, I'm 56 I have three doctorates. I've done everything I, I thought I was supposed to do in ministry. Until two years ago, I wasn't even walking in my ministry. The Shiner Directive is the first step of it. That I'm starting to walk in things that was prophesied over me when I was 21. They say, well, Mike, why did it what take that long to get there? <laughs> me! <laughs> me! My strongholds, my stupidity... You know, at least I was consistent. I got stuck on stoop, and I just kind of stayed there for quite a while, you know, and be consistent. But God has a purpose for every one of us. There, there's something that we're going to need in the last days, and it's the, the fifth aspect of grace, enduring grace. He who holds out to the end will be saved. You see, I want to be like the Apostle Paul. I want to finish the race. I want to complete everything that I had. And see, I know that I'm going to live for a while because God keeps on giving me this huge to-do list. <laughs> now, I will start worrying when it runs out and I'm saying, okay, next page, next page, <laughs> you know. But at the same time, when, when it's time for me to leave, I want there not to be one thing left that I can check off. And it's all by God's grace. And what people have done in this day is we have taken grace as an excuse to sin and its doctrines of demons. Now, let's look real quick and try to get back here into Jericho. Can we come back out of orbit? Okay. <laughs> the foundations of every stronghold are demonic in nature, just like it was with Jericho. True, true strongholds attract the giants in your life. The reason the enemy does not want you to get rid of your stronghold is it creates an open door or a conduit for him to bring more problems constantly into your life. We have worked to the place that problems do occur, but they're, they're not 14 a day. <laughs> it's like one every once in a while comes in because I don't have a 15-lane highway marked the kingdom of darkness has a right to come into my life. Because, guys, we need to realize that everything that we think, everything that we speak, and everything that we do either opens doors or closes doors. When you sin, you open up doors to the enemy while you're closing avenues for God to bless you. But when you repent and you start doing the right things, you begin closing the doors to the devil. We need to take away Satan's easy button in your life. Amen. That's why the power of repentance and letting the Holy Spirit work on you and understanding these natures. And here's one that, that Ach we learned with Achan. When God does tear down your stronghold, you can't take your favorite things and the excuses your stronghold used to give you. You can't take those with you. They will destroy you. They are accursed. The, the excuses stop at the cross. Where did it change that I can do all things in Christ that strengtheneth me? You're not the exception. The cross is the answer. 
you got to call that thing the accursed thing that it is because the very things that you use as excuses are taking the power of the kingdom away from you and giving the right for the enemy to mess with your life. Amen. We have to enter into the sanctification and facing your strongholds. It's time to man up. Because God's standing there with you. That's what I like about, about the Holy Spirit. He not only brings you to the stronghold, He puts His arms around you and says, I'm going to hold you up, I'm going to empower you to speak, and then I'm going to help you jump when it comes down. He is our paraclete. He is the one called alongside. Oh. I've had to face some very unpleasant realities about Mike Lake. Come on, the things that make you procrastinate when you shouldn't really procrastinate and, and miss windows of opportunity that God opens before you. But when I simply yielded to God's grace that it empowered me to face those and Almighty God began to work on me, the more of the kingdom that I began to be able to walk in. And the less trouble I created for myself. Because with a stronghold in your life, you can see the greatest enemy in your life in the morning when you simply look in the mirror. But see, that's not... Anybody ever read the book of, in the book of Mark where they were going everywhere and God was working with them, preaching the gospel, confirming it with signs and wonders? God's not going to dwell in the level that he wants to with that stronghold there. It will contaminate. But he says, if you get rid of it, I'll fill that spot so that I walk with you and I become your fortress for you to walk. Leave everything behind. The excuses stop. The excuses stop. Now, strategies for bringing down the stronghold we actually find in the previous chapter. The first thing that Joshua had them do was every man in the place got circumcised. They, were, they had not circumcised anybody the whole time that they were in the wilderness. So that entire generation had no expression of covenant with God. Your covenant with God and circumcision of the heart. How many know that's a greater circumcision? Amen. And that's God cutting away the junk of the world away from your heart that really covers up who you are we got to understand the nature of covenant. And God says when they did that, he rolled the reproach of Egypt off of them. We need to learn to cling to the cross and stay there and let Jesus do his work. And when he does, just like Pilgrim in the Pilgrim's Progress Christian, that burden, that reproach rolls off. We have too many people trying to do Christian service with that reproach still on them because they did not wrestle with God long enough at the altar. I do not believe in three-second conversions. Okay, I feel bad. You made me cry just a little bit. Okay, say these words. That don't work anymore. How many know that doesn't work? We, we have, we, I, I, am, I have spent a good portion of my life getting Christians saved. They're, what do you call it, C-notes, Christians in name only? Um, because they never let the convicting power of the Holy Spirit convict them of sin and sit there and wrestle with God. One of the men, when I was a, when I was a youth, he was a cowboy preacher. And he would get these cowboys just wailing at the altar. I mean, just, I mean it, it was a place of tears and snot and everything else going on. <laughs> And he would walk by and he would slap them on the back and said, I'd be crying too if I'd lived like you. <laughs> you, better, you better really cry out because you got some crying to do for Jesus to really deal with you, Jack. I know, I know what kind of cowboy you have been. But you know what? They may have been at that altar for an hour, hour and a half, just pouring out their hearts to God, letting God really cleanse them. When they got up, they were changed men that's what i'm talking about letting the holy spirit do his work we got to get rid of this microwave generation then they celebrated passover establishing covenant relationship how 
do, do we understand what covenant relationship is? Do we understand what it means to walk with God? When Almighty God showed up to Abram, and he said, I am Almighty God, I am El Shaddai. Walk upright before me and be thou perfect. And we hear that in the English. You know what, Jack? I'm here now. I've got my on you. Isn't that what it sounds like in English? Abram, that is not what it says in the Hebrew at all. He, said, he says, I am El Shaddai. That, that, that is the all-sufficient one, but there's a flip side to El Shaddai. It can also mean, I am your destroyer. That somebody messes with you, they mess with me. I kind of like that. <laughs> and he said, come walk with me, and in the walking, I will make you whole. It's in the halakha, it's in the walking with God, the day in, the day out, learning that covenant. We went from wimpy Abram that goes down to Egypt and tells Pharaoh, she's my sister, you know. <laughs> because he was, he was not that assured in who he was in that covenant. Later on, Lot is taken when, when you have four armies of four different kings take Sodom and Gomorrah. And his response is, let's round up some boys and we're going to go down and we're going to open up a can of whoop <laughs> on these boys. And then after he sets him free, the king of, of Sodom comes to him and says, I'm going to give you all this wealth. He rejects it and says, let no man say he has made Abraham rich but almighty God. What happened to, she's my sister? He grew up Amen. that in the walking and in the things that God had him do, he got deep in that covenant relationship with God. And we missed the point that that same God walking in the shores of Galilee said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I get hung up on the first part. I will make you. Come walk with me in that covenant and I will make you. It's in that blood covenant and really walking with God. Day in and day out, I have a constant conversation with God. You know, I watched Phil on the roof and it inspired me. God, did you see the phone call that I just got? I, you know, <laughs> you know? and I, I, you know, it's like, oh, Lord, how do I do this? And what do you think about this? And it's amazing how smart I get when I listen to him. Which is so refreshing because Mike Lake was stuck on stupid for so long. You know, people say, oh, Mike, you're so smart. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm just a good listener. <laughs> he taught, you know, he, you know, his mouth, my ear, out my mouth. And you go, boy, he's smart. No. What he whispers, I shout. We also got to understand and then moving forward in God and really doing what we're supposed to do we got to move from manna to possession. This is significant because the charismatic church has built a ministry about producing manna. What you need is a miracle. How do you get a miracle? You throw money at it. <laughs> well, I did it. I didn't get anything. Wasn't a big enough wad. <laughs> You know, thus saith Lord, give me them big words, you know. They, they, they preach that way, and I'm not talking about, you know, not sowing proper seed, and it's connected. The tithe itself is connected to where you get your spiritual meat because it originates the first time in the Bible is Melchizedek when he gave the revelation of the bread and the wine to Abram. Abraham responded by establishing the tithe. But this throwing money at everything is wilderness mentality. God doesn't want to rain gold down from heaven on you. He wants to, you to get to the place to where you never need a miracle. Amen. Because he blessed the works of your hands. When you do the right thing, you get the right harvest. It's by saying the right thing, by loving and walking in the kingdom and letting the Holy Spirit correct you that you begin planting great seeds in your life that God can bless. And see, God's real, because that's what they did the minute they crossed over the Jordan and kept the covenant, the manna stopped. Because now it was God and sons. It was God and daughters. 
What gets me excited, the Shiner Directive started with a two-sentence thought I sent to Tom Horn. Hey, wouldn't it be neat to talk about all this weird Nephilim stuff, throw a little Hebraic heritage into it? What do you think? Is it done yet? I'm going, okay. <laughs> Sit down. Okay, God, you've commissioned me to write this. Where do I start? The moment that I yielded all the right things that I had done and all the studying that I had done, in those moments came absolute lucidity. I love the anointing of the Holy Spirit because in those moments, I remember everything that I've ever heard or I have ever read. I know can't do that when that's not there. But it's because of, and I'm saying, God, how can I can do this now? And he said, because you spent the last 20 years doing what I told you to do, and you finally got a harvest that's coming in, that I can go ahead and do it. And now I can't turn it off. Got another book coming out, The Shurith Imperative, at the end of this year. I've got two more in the hopper that I've already started writing. It's like once you start, you can't stop. Because, because once that farmer has fields and fields and fields of harvest, it's time to come in. He just starts his tractor, and he just keeps on doing that tractor until he gets the harvest in. And some people look at that and say, why, what, not a miracle. It wasn't a miracle. He planted, he watered, he tilled, he made sure he kept the bad things out of, out of his land. That's what God wants. God needs to adjust our paradigms. Paradigm is the way that you see things. And every one of us see things according to Babylon. Everything about our, everything about our culture is Babylon. TV programs you to think like a Babylonian. If they could sell the fact that walking around with a cow pie in your pocket made you cool, there would be a shortage of manure on planet Earth. <laughs> because every teenager on the planet would have at least a half a pound in their pocket. Because whatever the television tells them to do, whatever the radio tells them to do, whatever the talking heads tell them to do, that becomes their reality. We need to move beyond that because my reality is a greater kingdom. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. I have learned that there is a greater kingdom. And I'm walking in that kingdom that may, 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 stick, you know, I may stick out like a sore thumb. And if you ever experienced, you even get among believers, and all of a sudden you stick out like a sore thumb because you believe the word of God. And they look at you like you have lost your mind. They're thinking Babylon. You're thinking kingdom of God. Amen. But see, that paradigm adjustment is needed. Because God wants to speak some things through you. You know, sometimes it can be just a loving moment with a grandchild. And you can speak something. I, I want you to see the contrast here. Somebody moving in ungodly authority spoke something to you in your childhood or did something to you in your childhood that caused a wound, that caused a stronghold. Now Almighty God can use you to speak a true word, to do an act of love, to show kindness, to mentor, that you begin establishing the kingdom of God in that child that will last them the rest of their lives. Grandma, grandpas, you got a mission to do. And I tell you what, being a grandpa is the neatest thing on the planet. And if I knew that it was this much fun and grandbabies were this awesome, I would have started with them. <laughs> then my daughter tells me, yeah, but you were pretty rough in those early days. We had to break you in, you know. Um, but just to see, I've got grandbabies that from the time they came out of the womb, they've heard me preach like this their whole life. This is their definition of hearing the word of God. And if they hear anything of lesser caliber, they, Amen. he needs to have grandpa teach him how to preach. You know? <laughs> when, when you have, you know, an eight -year -old, do you not know exegesis? That preacher's not exegeting right. Yeah, that's, that's my grand boy, you know. <laughs> but see, it's those kids that stand up in school 
and will stand up for the helpless, that will stand up for the unpopular and invite them to church and say, let's tell you about Jesus. Let's tell you about something better than what they got. Oh, man. You see, that's where we're at. And I have nine minutes left. It's a, it's a, guys, you have just witnessed a supernatural miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. I used to teach 90 minutes back in the old days of cassette tapes because I thought it was my responsibility for God to make sure there was no tape left. <laughs> but guys, every one of us have a task. Our task is to find the strongholds and the lies the enemy has put in us and having the wherewithal by the power of the Holy Spirit to call them lies. The moment that you call them lies and begin speaking what God's word really says, that stronghold loses its power. And as a representative of heaven today, I give you permission from the throne of God to speak truth to the lies the enemy has sold you. You have the right from the throne room of our Heavenly Father to tell, look the devil in the face and say, you know what, I've caught on about you. You're a liar. That's a lie. That is not me. That is, who, that is not who Almighty God created me to be. That you're trying to mar who Almighty God made me. And you have been in my life long enough. And call it the lie and be declaring the word of God. And I guarantee the moment that you do it, the resonance of Almighty God will begin flowing in your words. And the things the devil built in your life and in your family's lives will be tore down. It's time to get the shout back in the body of Christ. Amen. It's time. Now, I've got several websites, and in fact, I've got nine websites, but the central hub for everything that we do is kingdomintelligencebriefing.com, or an easier one is just drmichaellake.com. It'll take you to the same place. Uh, all of our videos, I've got over 300 videos of me teaching the Word of God that's on our YouTube channel. You can access it by here. My wife and I do a podcast every week uh, that we put up, and a lot of times I'll, if I'll interview somebody, I'll put those up as extras. Um, it'll, it'll take you to Biblical Life College and Seminary if you want to get deeper in the Word. Uh, study for ministry if you just like to get deeper. Everything that I have taught for Biblical Life College and Seminary is now available to anybody. That you can just simply buy the study guide and the lectures and just get as deep as you want. And we're seeing people all over the world. Just there is such a hunger all over the world. I don't care if it's in the heart of America, the middle of the jungle in South Africa. New Zealand, they're, they're even smuggling our stuff into China. And so the hunger is there, and wherever the remnant are, that is my passion to get them the word and to equip them for the last days. Guys, you've been great, and uh, thank you for allowing me to stray off my notes today. <laughs>